much more detailed version of the last of the two hours from last week and at least the first hour from this week, then this is this is essentially the best thing you can find. Um, so for more sort of rigorous statements about how this function f relates to h and things, um, where are we? Sorry, too far. So a lot of the notation here is, is essentially the same as, as in my lecture notes, um, which is helpful. Um, so what do we know? So we know, for example, let me, so there's this lemma that tells us sort of various properties. So, so for some given function h, there's this, there's this f that's a solution to the step to the Stein equation. Okay. This 2.4 is the same as my equation one, whatever I call the Stein equation. Mm -hmm. And essentially this gives you the sort of conditions under which, so if, if, H, if H is bounded, then that, that right hand side is finite, so F is bounded. Um, if H is bounded, F prime is bounded as well. And you, you, you essentially sort of, at least the, the way I think about it is, is reading off the conditions under which the upper bound is finite. I and mean, somehow it's tied. If if H is um, quadratic, say, then then that's that's infinite, and so that bound that, that inequality is is either trivial or non-informative, however you want to think about it. Um, so this is sort of usually the way that at least I would think about these things is, is we sort of want functions for which the upper bound is finite and the upper bound holds. Okay. So. I guess the, uh, so do I understand correctly that uh, the functions h which are of interest uh, to us is either Lipschitz with constant one or with border one because of uh, Wasserstein distance and uh, I guess are we interested in Kolmogorov distances too? Yes, yeah, Le less so for the for the um, purposes of my lectures, but in general, yes, yeah. Okay, uh, so so usually bounded or Lipschitz with Lipschitz constant one. Okay, all right. Th th these are the for both for us and in general in the literature. These are these are the classes of functions that are the, that are the most interesting. Okay, I see. So there um, are others as well, and um, so there's a relatively recent paper. I think it might still be under review somewhere. I guess. Um, so there's in the Poisson approximation setting, does um, Lipschitz type, sorry, um, Wasserstein type distances, but for, for non-linear cost. So, so essentially, what, so the, the, the Wasserstein distance we're thinking about is all is all built on linear functions, um, but, but you can you could build it on sort of quadratic functions and things like that, and essentially mm -hmm. solving in this case a Stein equation for a Poisson approximation in, in that setting. And this was but this was not known until this say relatively recent paper that was sort of this year sometime I think. Um, okay. So, so, there, so there, there, there is still sort of active research going on in terms of in terms of properties of solutions to standard equations for wider and wider classes of functions. Um, in general, okay. things do get a lot harder if you stop being bounded or Lipschitz or something. Mm. Um, the, the, oh. These are the easiest things to work with, and also in some sense the most natural and the most useful. Um, but but definitely this does interest in in other less well behaved functions for which the, the for which you can't just exploit these kind of simple inequalities and you need something a bit more complicated. All right, thank you. I mean, it's just while we were discussing, there was this uh, feeling that oh, okay, so it's not correct in general. But then was but I mean, okay, we need it for only for Lipschitz and Bowden, so who cares? So <laughs> that's why we just we kind of was interested. Hmm, but how far we might want to go is there applications where you want to go far, further a little bit so yeah, yeah. So, so yeah you can certainly imagine applications that, that where you want a, a, a less well behaved class of functions less less bounded or whatever um, whatever less bounded means <laughs> okay <laughs> in the sense okay. that, um, linear is, uh, is not but <laughs> It's quite good that we already start conversation, but it seems that as a participant, they wanted to see a lecture or <laughs> yes. something different. What, what did you prepare, Fraser? And yeah. I think we can start. We will continue the same way that 
there will be two of us or three of us with a camera video on. Okay, two of us and Fraser, of course. We will sit here. Everyone can ask the questions. Everyone can write the questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know, Fraser, when you want to make a comment about the last lecture now or later or already made everything. So, so the, I'll, I'll say one or two other things, and maybe I'll I'll fit that in. I'll, I'll, I'll go very quickly, just in five minutes, over, over what we did last week, and maybe stop at some point points along that, and, and deal with a couple of questions that we that's, that we still haven't haven't answered. Okay, you, that sounds you, okay. You can start. Yeah, you can start, please. Okay. Let's start. Oh. So, well, well, welcome back. Let me just get back to back to where we were. All right. So, so last week we essentially introduced Stein's method for, for Gaussian approximation. And we saw this we saw the characterization that was at the at the heart of that that gives us a way of characterizing this underlying underlying Gaussian distribution. We saw how to turn that into a, a Stein equation. So what we built an equation which essentially on the left-hand side gives us a way of quantifying the, the distance between some random variable, which we call W. And, a, and our Gaussian random variable, what's on the right hand side was built out of the, this characterization that we had. So that let us um, write down essentially this, write down a representation, which I can't find now, um, get a, a representation for, for the Wasserstein distance or the um, Kolmogorov distance with two particular examples we, we were looking at. Um, between some, some random variable W, which we somehow think is approximately Gaussian, and some, ga some um, Gaussian random variable. To, sorry, I'm going to scroll back a little bit. We had to talk about, um, so when I think of the Stein equation, I think of H as a function that I know, as we said, and, and F as a solution to this equation, which is going to depend on H. Um, so I, I, one, one of the one of the points which came out of um, out of your, your discussions following the lecture was sh should we think of this as sort of specifying well, is it better to think of just f as, as a the unique bounded solution of that or is it better to specify it as as taking some particular value at say zero or whatever um, so there were so I, I, I think I was mildly confused and I was confusing slightly the Poisson and Gaussian cases when I was when I was talking last week and actually it is much better you're absolutely right to think of it as just as a unique, to think of F as a unique bounded solution of that equation, and don't worry too much about what it's doing at, at any particular point like zero. Um, so just define F as a unique bounded solution of that. And, if, and in fact, it's not even going to be zero or zero. That was, I was, that was a mistake. I, I was, yeah, I, I said something I didn't mean. <laughs> so you, you're absolutely right. And it's better to think of F as just a unique bounded solution of that. Um, um, in, in the discrete case, we have some more flexibility, but we'll talk about that in a, in a Poisson approximation setting probably next week, I imagine. But anyway. It's good that we understand something and we can yeah, correct. <laughs> you you, you correct me. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's. So I should say, I guess I've updated my lecture notes slightly. I've made two small changes following last week's lecture. That was one of them. Um, so what I will do is either. If I miss, make a significant enough change, number of changes before the end of our, our three or four lectures, I'll, I'll send you out a, a new version of the lecture notes um, before the end. Otherwise, I'll wait till the end because if there's only one or two minor things per week, then I'll just wait till the end and send you a, a new version with some with the, the typos that we've managed to spot between us and correct it. But that's one change I made. Um, okay, so we know. So we need to talk about the, the solution to that. We've talked about this sort of representation, we just discussed that a little bit. I'm not sure there's a lot else that we wanted to talk about with, um, with, with that representation, Am I, unless I'm missing something. Um, and say so we said, so once we, once we have this, this solution of my Stein equation, we're going to at some point need some properties of, of, that, of that solution. We just said so before the lecture, I think, I think we dealt with, with questions that we had that that arose from that. But feel free to chip in with any others if there's something that I haven't said already that, that someone is interested in. Um, but let's say this was, once we have this, this solution f, we need some properties of, of tell us how the solution behaves in terms of the function h that we're, 
that we're interested in, um, which as I say, we're often going to think of as, when we're looking at the Wasserstein distance as being the Lipschitz, with Lipschitz constant one, in which case I can, I can apply this bound. Um, there are a whole host of other, other bounds on, on this function f, which I say, if you're interested, and in, in, then there's this book by, um, by Chen Goldstein and Shao, which I, the normal approximation book, which is, there's a, the notation in, the, in my lecture notes and in this book are essentially the same, which, which is hopefully helpful, but there are a whole bunch of properties here. Um, essentially lots of, that tells a lot about how this function f behaves depending on what we can assume about the underlying function h. So we can apply these, these if it, if these ones in um, the equation 212 if h is bounded, for example, if h is differentiable, we, we can also apply these bounds in 213. So we have a whole host of, of results, um, which I, I, I presented only the two that we'll use, and it's essentially only this first one that we'll, that we'll use very much, this uh, second result, which looks a little bit more exotic, which I, which I showed you and didn't say anything about the proof of, we'll, we'll use in one place, but only one. So then after we'd sort of established these more or less fundamentals and of, of set, setting up the problem more or less, we talked about how we can um, then use this setup to give ourselves a bound in, firstly for a, a normal approximation for a sum of independent random variables. And so we saw a bound that was, so it's, it's explicit, it was completely explicit error bound, not just a, a rate of convergence, uh, which we said has the correct order. It'll look like a sort of one over square root of n or something like this, I don't know, but with a typically bad constant. Um, Okay, the constant isn't awful. I mean, it's, it's four is, a, is, a, is not a huge number, but it's definitely not optimal. And then the last thing we did was we saw how the proof that we, we used in this independent case essentially extended and generalized to some case of local dependence. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we talked about, I mean, there, are, there are sort of variety of local dependence assumptions that we could make, which essentially say that, um, that each individual term in my sum, each individual X in my, um, will depend only on, or depend strongly only on relatively few of the other X's, and the dependence on other X's is relatively weak. Um, so there was, we had one particular way of forming Realizing that there are a whole host of others that have been have been dealt with, um, and there are a whole host of others that you can think of. That, but but this is sort of just one example. And we we saw essentially that, that the same proof that held in the independent case still continues to hold in the in the dependent case. We need to be a little bit more careful about the one or two places we'd used independence, but it was essentially the same idea, um, albeit a bit more complicated. So the one, I think the only point from last week's lecture that I haven't, the only question from last week's lecture that I haven't said anything about was the one that came up during the lecture, which was essentially, what can we do other than in the local dependence case, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly? So let me say just, what well, point you in, in a couple of directions, I, I guess. Um, so, so look, sort of local dependence, in the sense that, de depend that the dependence is strong only for random variables which are somehow close in, in time or in space or, or in, in some other sense um, is, is one direction in which Stein's method tends to work very well. The other direction in which, in which Stein's method tends to work very well, and we'll, we'll say a lot more about this when we talk about Poisson approximation in a week or so, um, is when perhaps the dependence has some monotonicity properties. So in the sense that, um, so perhaps we have some collection of random variables. And if I know that one of these collections is, so one of these random variables is somehow larger than I'd expect, then the others are somehow larger than, larger than I'd otherwise expect as well. Um, so I'll, I'll say more about these kinds of things later on. But this kind of monotonicity idea, where given, if I give you some information about how big one of my collection of random variables is that tells you a lot about how 
big some of the other ones are as well, either because you expect these other ones to be larger if I tell you a random variable is large, or I expect things to be smaller. So we'll say more about this next week, but this kind of monotonicity is another um, setting where Stein's method tends to work very well. And um, there are a lot of bounds which have been proved under, under these sort of monotone conditions on the dependence, which doesn't at all, which don't, doesn't at all rely on this being local. I mean, I'm allowed to, when I tell you this dependence is monotone, I can, telling you something about one of my, my random variables X can give you information about all of the others. Right? I'm not assuming that this is in any way local. And these kind of monotonicity conditions have also, there's some relatively recent work that's unconnected to Stein's method, but um, at least wasn't developed in the context of Stein's method, which tells you that some of these monotonicity results are linked to sort of alpha mixing type conditions. Um, so if you wanted to sort of phrase, um, so if, if, if you wanted to phrase results in terms of mixing conditions, um, one natural way to do it might be to um, think about what alpha mixing means in terms of monotonicity and then use results on sort of monotone type dependence um, that are already available. As far as I'm aware, nobody's done this in the setting of Stein's method. Um, as far as I'm aware, that's, that's no problem, but, but I, I, I may be wrong, don't take my word for that, but, um, but if, if I wanted to write down, down say conditions in terms of uh, mix, in terms of say alpha mixing type coefficients, I think it's possible that some, some rephrasing of, of monotone dependence type results will give you that. Um, so in terms of, in a, in a normal approximation setting, then there's, this paper was essentially the first to think about this sort of monotone dependence in the setting of, of positive association, which is one way of, of capturing sort of positive dependence between random variables. Um, there's been a couple of papers that this second author's then written that follow on from this, um, that, that essentially build on the same framework and, and essentially ex extend the work that they did here, but this was this is a reason, quite a reasonable starting point. So that's sort of one direction which, which you could think about going in. Um, the other, the other direction is, is not directly related to Stein's method, but somehow is very close to it. Um, so back in the early 80s, I'm, I'm going to show you a paper which I can't read. And I've seen an English version of this as well, but given the audience, I'll show you the original. Um, so there is, there is, so Tikamurov did some work um, which essentially writes, uh, so looks at, let me go, looks at things like, for example, uh, the, so alpha mixing coefficients and, and other notions of, of dependence and under some conditions on, um, under some conditions on these, on these uh, mixing coefficients gives you bounds on, I think this is called McGraw distance if I'm right, you bounds on Kolmogorov distance between a sum of, of dependent random variables and, and a Gaussian. So this is, so this paper doesn't use Stein's method. Okay, so this is, um, this is absolutely not a Stein's method paper, but what it does do is use some ideas which are sort of somehow very closely related to Stein's method. So, and it's sort of, so the author even acknowledges this somewhere. Um, Somewhere there is a, there is a reference to Stein's paper, which I can't see. But <laughs> somewhere in this introduction is a reference to Stein's paper. Um, it was ten. Ten. Okay. Yes, ten. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this, this looks sensible. Yeah. <laughs> this is easier for me to see in the English version. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so the, the the proof is somehow. How, so the, the, the proof of this paper uses characteristic functions, but is, is based on essentially a differential equation satisfied by, by the characteristic function of a Gaussian, which somehow is very close to the characterization that Stein used of a Gaussian to, to develop his ideas. So somehow it's, it's 
very much parallel to Stein's ideas, but somehow different. Um, and I think it's still, I think there's still some work that could be done on, on how these two ideas relate to each other. There's been a little done since, the, since this was written in the early 80s, but not an awful lot, I think. Um, so it's somehow, there are interesting intersections with, with, with these ideas that are coming off. Um, that, that might be yeah. might be, I think, right at some point. Thanks. I think, yeah, we, we can look on these references. Yeah, so I, I can, of course, email links to these things um, to, to yeah. Yeah, I thought it was more useful to say something first and then send you links afterwards rather than, rather than the other way around. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I can do that. Okay, so let me close all these other PDFs I've opened just to stop my system running too slowly. So what I want to do this week is more or less show you, well, start off with a couple of other ideas that we can use um, to for de for the dependent case. So, unreal so dif different I different ideas other than the things I've just shown you and the uh, things that we talked about last week. So there's sort of fur some further ideas about dealing with um, say sums of dependent random variables. T typically, Stein's method is phrased in terms of convolutions of random variables. Um, at least for sort of Gaussian or Poisson approximations, these are sort of usually the frameworks that people are thinking about. So there are sort of historically one of the first ways that Stein's method was 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 um, applied to to say sums of dependent random variables was using a, a, an approach based on an exchangeable pair of random variables. So I'm not going to say too much about this because it's sort of it's not. Somehow this, this idea hasn't been developed as much in recent years as some of the other ideas that I, wanted to, I do want to spend some time on. Um, let's say this is, I'm, I'm guided in all, as always in these lectures by some of my own personal taste and I haven't thought about these exchangeable pairs quite as, quite as much as I thought about some other ideas. So, um, so I'm going to go relatively quickly on here. But So the idea is that we, so we start off with, with a pair of random variables. So W is the random variable which I want to approximate that I think is, is approximately Gaussian in whatever sense. And I have some, some W primed, so that, so that W and W primed are exchangeable random variables. So essentially, probabilistically, if I show you realizations of this, of this pair, you can't tell me which one was which. It's all exchangeable means. And on top of exchangeability, I'm going to assume that there's some linearity condition, which is essentially some analog of some, I guess, some generalization of what I would get if this pair really were bivariate normal. Then if, if they were bivariate normal with some correlation rho, then I, then I know how to say something about one of them conditioned on the other. I just get this coefficient of rho coming out. So we'll assume something that sort of looks a bit like this in that the expectation of W prime conditional on W which is going to be some constant, call it one minus lambda, times W. So some, some sort of linearity condition as well. I'll show you a couple of examples where we get that. But that turns out to be, to be useful in that I can write down explicit approximation theorems. So there's, a, there's one one such result you can get in this exchangeable pairs setting. Again, looking at Wasserstein distance because things are generally easier there. So it depends on this constant lambda that we get out. I mean, it depends on things like the variance of the, of the, the variance of the conditional expectation of the square difference between these two exchangeable things. So essentially how, how close can we assume that they, that they are, how, and, and the third moment of that difference as well. And, so essentially, we need to some we need to have some control over how far apart this W and this W prime are in in a in a certain sense, but um, but that once if we can control that, then then I can control the the Wasserstein distance between this W and this Z. Um, so I say I and this this doesn't rely on on W being any kind of sum of of anything, or and this just applies for any any random variable W that I want that I want. 
let me skip the anything I'm going to say about the proof of that just for a minute and let me I say that so that that result doesn't need w to be any kind of sum but somehow we often think about about the case where w is a sum and it's as always easiest to think about the case where we have a sum of independent random variables in which case it's not too hard to um, to construct this exchangeable pair so if I have this sum of, of x1 to xn so these x's are independent random variables and then I'll take some x primes to be independent copies of those so x1 primed is just an independent copy of x1 then all I'm going to do is choose one of these um, one of these numbers one up to n uniformly at random swap the corresponding x with an x primed and, and, that, and that will give me a and then take the sum of, of, of those so the sum of n minus one of my original random variables plus an extra plus plus the, the extra x prime that I that I chose and that gives me that gives me an exchangeable pair of random variables so if I showed you realizations of these two you couldn't tell me which one was which and they all look the same because this whichever x I've replaced by an x primed that x primed is just, is just an independent copy of that x so it looks exactly the same and everything's independent anyway and it's not too hard to see that we we get this sort of linearity condition um, essentially if I yeah that, that, that's not too hard to see I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you to think about but um, so so we get a constant this this lambda we get there is 1 over n which is going to give us essentially the right when we work out these variance terms and things like this as well it's going to give going to make sure that we get the right order of bound here so that that lambda is a constant in some sense but remember that constant can depend for example on, on my underlying parameter n so it's so we can't just it's not an absolute constant independent of the problem another nice way that i quite like to to be able to um construct these um these exchangeable pairs are as is, is as a um, consecutive steps in a reversible markov chain so if I take, so if I can think of the random variable W that I want to approximate as the state of my Markov chain at some time, if that Markov chain is reversible, so if I can construct W as a, as a state of a reversible Markov chain, then W prime could be the, say, the next step after it in time, so two consecutive steps of this reversible Markov chain. But, sorry, but stationary reversible Markov chain, I should say stationarity is important because I want the distribution of W and W prime to be the same. So I need this Markov chain to be, to be stationary, I need it to be reversible. And then W and W prime are going to be exchangeable. And I can, I can use, I, I can then use this sort of idea and use, use my underlying Markov construction to, to um, first of all, get exchangeability and secondly, get some linearity condition as well. So one, one setting where I can do this, um, so I'm, I, I can take, for example, W is a, um, a sum of a sample of, num of numbers, sample of size little n, say, from some set of numbers, um, A1 up to A capital N. So I have some big set of numbers, my, my A's, which are deterministic. I'm taking some random sample of size little n without replacement from that set of numbers. Then, I can write that as the as a, as a state of Markov as a state of Markov chain where the transitions in my Markov chain are just to choose something that's already in my sample and swap it with something that isn't. And so all I do is choose uniformly at random something that's in my sample of size little n and swap it with a number which is which I which of the of these capital N numbers which it which isn't already in my sample. Is, is that is that okay? Does that that construction make sense? First, I want to another question. The yeah. W and W prime, they by definition should have the same distribution. Yes. That, yeah. Sorry, that's correct. That's part of being exchangeable is that they um, so they that they have they have the same distribution and and 
they, I, it also shouldn't, that bivariate random variable WW prime is invariant under swapping the order of the elements as well. So that's somehow, yeah. And is it this example with Marco team important? Maybe you can draw a picture if it's. Um, so I'm, good. we're not going to use it again. So okay. okay. If, if, so I'm, uh, I'm clearly understand previous example and <laughs> it's fine for me. Yeah. So th th this, this takes a little bit more thought. Um, yeah. So it's sort of I, in, in, intuitively. If all of these numbers a somehow look the same, then then this um, if if I, if I swapped one, I sort of take something out of my sample and put something different in. Then, if I show you that lots of times, you sort of couldn't tell me which one was which, which was the one I started with, and which was the one that I did so this sort of swapping procedure. Which is which which one came first in this Markov chain? I'm doing this swap lots of times. So I show you a couple of. Couple of couple of states of this Markov chain. It's not you couldn't tell me which one came first, which was the thing that I that was in my sample and then I out versus which is the thing that I put in. Um, this thing's reversible. I can I can un I can undo what I did just by swapping the same two elements and the, that that's that that probabilistically does the same thing as a, as a as one of the steps that I had anyway. Um, so somehow this. This, it's sort of it, it's reversible. It's somehow stationary because I'm not. I'm just starting by choosing some random set of, of n elements, so I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not distinguishing anything. I'm not starting off according to some deterministic state. So somehow everything sort of works. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to. I'll leave it to you to think about. I, I think we're not going to come back to this, so I think okay. it's probably it's. I think that's okay. I, I'm, I'm not going to say very much about the proof of. of this bound either, um, but I the sort of the, the one nice nice trick I guess, and the, really the one place where you, you really use exchangeability um, is in is the fact that if I have this exchangeable pair, then for certain functions g, the expected value of g of w and w prime is going to be zero. Um, so the functions g for which I need that to be true are, are sort of anti-symmetric in the sense that um, if I if I swap w and w primed then then um, I, I don't I pull a minus sign out of it so anti-symmetric just means that so g of um, x and y is minus g of y and x so, okay. mm -hmm. yep. With this, with this particular choice of, of function g, for which that's true, um, I'm, then well, I'm, I'm going to take f to be the solution to my Stein equation. Then that tells me that this expectation is zero, and sort of a little bit of playing around with that um, gets me a, more or less a, a w f of w, which is one of the terms in my in my Stein equation. In terms of, well, at least something that could plausibly end up looking a bit like an f primed, a bit like a derivative, in that I'm, I've, mm -hmm. I've got some difference of f values. I've got some difference of the values inside my f's. It's sort of plausible, I think, that we can turn that into something that looks a bit like a first derivative. Um, this is somehow the, the I think, I think the, the clever idea in the proof is using this anti-symmetric function and seeing how that works. To get me a get me a term for my um, my w. I'm using this linearity condition here at some point as well, um, which gets me this constant lambda out. Anyway, as, so I mean, as, as I said, as I said there, and as I said, as we sort of said in the when we were looking at the independent case things um, for some of the independent random variables last week, the idea is with these kind of proofs somehow I've I mean. I've, what, what I want to bound is the expected value of f primed of w minus the expected value of wf of w. And somehow the idea underlying all these proofs is to 
more or less try and make this w f of w look a bit like an f primed of something that's sort of essentially the philosophy i mean there was still some taylor expansion to do that last week this is there's these um, this exchangeable pair approach that does more or less the same kind of idea so somehow the the, the philosophy is i want to make this second term look a lot like f primed of something is one very vague idea one very sort of general and vague and, and very imprecise idea but here's here's one way of making that idea extremely precise and in a very natural sort of way and this is an idea of, of which is going to be known as sort of zero biased coupling so let's define a random variable we'll the, the zero biased version of, of, of W. So W I think is something that's approximately Gaussian. Let's, we're gonna fix that with mean zero and, and, and for now just finite variance. I, mean, I want to take variance one at some point, but for now just finite variance. I can define this, what's called a zero biased version of, of this random variable W. I'll call that W with a, with a um, Z as a superscript. I personally don't like this notation very much because I think it's far too easy to think of Z as a, as a number, which, which is some kind of power here. And that's not true. So this is, this is not a power. This is just a, a, a transformed version of my W that I started with. So I, I think the, the notation isn't good, but somehow this notation is, is standard. And so I, I stuck with it, but I don't like it very much. So we'll define this transformed version, this zero biased version of W, by saying that this equation holds essentially for all g for which I can actually write everything down for which is differentiable and which does and expectations exist, for example, things like this. So I'm saying that the I'm defining my zero biased random variable by saying that the expectation of g primed of the zero biased version is just one over the variance times the expected value of of wg of w. For now let's, let's think of sigma squared as 1 because most of the time we're going to apply this with sigma squared as 1 so let's, let's ignore the variance term and this is in some way uh, assuming this definition makes sense which I'll which I haven't sort of said that it has yet but this um, is a very natural way to turn my wg of w into a g primed of something. Right? This is sort of what the proofs have done somehow. The, and the, the other proofs have worked very hard to make a, to make a wf of w look, look like an f primed of something. But now we're sort of almost doing that by definition. Right? We're, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm turning, I can turn my wf of w into an f primed of, of the zero biased version just using this definition, which then makes it very easy to write down bounds, I'll, oh, it's not too hard to see, let me just, to write down bounds in terms of, say, the Wasserstein distance between W and a, and, a, and a normal in terms of these things, I'll show you how to do that in a second, it's, it's, it's almost automatic. The hard bit then becomes actually working out what that random variable is, so, and, and that's what we'll, we'll spend, I'll spend a bit of time talking about that in a minute. I guess the first thing to, to say is that this definition really, really does make sense. This is this zero bias transformation of my of my W is is a well defined random variable for for any any W any W that I want to give you. Um, so there's this this paper of Goldstein and Goldstein and Reiner that first introduced this back in the late nineties, I think. I think nineteen ninety seven. Um, so also. Zero bias transformation or zero bias distribution depends only on sigma. I mean, so, W is... Mm -hmm. So, so get, get, given a random variable W, it's, which, which, tell, which tells you what, which will give you the variance. So, so say, sigma squared is the variance of W. So once I give you a W, you can define a, 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 a ah, okay. zero bias so, transformation of yeah. this, yeah. No. It's not W, it's not normal, yeah, okay, sorry. No, no, so, sorry, no, so, so W is, is anything, 
um, anything at all. So, so I guess the one thing I didn't say is that we're assuming it has mean zero. So this definition needs needs that to make sense. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, okay. This is just any random variable with zero mean and some finite variance, okay. So. Yeah. Um, so Sergey is asking why zero biased. So the um, the terminology his, his, historically Gaussian approximation came before before um, Poisson approximation, but these sort of coupling ideas were actually applied much earlier in Poisson approximation than in this sort of Gaussian setting. In a Poisson approximation setting, the sort of analog is is size biasing, which I think. But the, where the name is sort of somehow very natural because we're um, transforming in a way that that weights that weights the mass function by the size of the of the number that you're looking at. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about size biasing later on. And somehow um, the zero biasing comes from the fact that here in this normal setting where we make some definition which does essentially the, the analogous thing we're working with we're working with mean zero random variables so this has to have zero mean to make sense i assume that's where mean zero biasing comes from i just just like the notation i don't like very much um this is not necessarily what i would have called it if i developed this either but but anyway the, the so idea is zero it is a mean zero Yes, yeah. Because I thought that zero it is a difference between the left and right sides. No? Um, so it, it is, but I think that's not where the name comes from. Okay. Um, so we, I, 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 I think the name becomes because we're thinking about, about random variables with mean zero. Thanks. Okay, so, the, so once we've got a mean zero random variable, this, this definition makes sense. Um, you can. It's not too hard to see what the um, what the density function of this of this um, transform this zero biased random variable is. So, just to, yeah, it depends on sort of weight, weighted tails of this random variable w we start with. This zero bias transformation is is a continuous random variable whether the whether the w that we start with is is continuous or discrete. So. This is somehow not necessarily what you'd expect, but, but it's true. So it has, a, it has a density, whether the W that we start with has a density or not. A couple of exercises if you want to have a go at them or not. We will do. So um, the other thing that's sort of clear from the way that we've defined this, so let me, let's stick with the case where sigma squared is one. So my, my, the variance of W is one for now. Another way of, of saying, um, another way of phrasing the characterization of the Stein equation, so the characterization of the Gaussian that we had way back at the start of, of last week's lecture, is to say that, that that Gaussian is the unique fixed point of this transformation. So the fact that that, that characterization tells, tells us that essentially W is Gaussian if and only if W and WZ as it revised version, had the same distribution. So yep. that's that's just a completely equivalent way of phrasing the characterization that, that we had. So somehow you could even start with this if you like. Um, I, I could have defined this in, on my first you know, on the first page and then gone from there with it, with, with everything, but I didn't. Um, so somehow you expect then that. The closer that the closer the zero biased version is to the W I started with, the closer W should be to Gaussian. Somehow, and we have this this intuition, and and we can make we can make that precise say with the with these kind of bounds, um, which comes almost immediately from the definition. I mean, we the. If I want to bounce, let's say, the Wasserstein distance between my random variable w and z, I'm going to look at the supremum of, of, of this, uh, this sort of expression over, over Lipschitz functions h with Lipschitz constant 1. 
my Stein equation gives me another way of writing that. So that's exactly what we saw um, last week in, a, in the examples that, that, we, that we dealt with there. Um, the, um, this gives me a, a, this is exactly the representation of my vast time distance we worked with last week. Then I, I use my definition of zero biasing to turn that WF of W into an F primed of, of my zero biased version, at least with expectations in the right place. But then I've got the difference of F, F prime of W and F prime of W of my zero biased version. Since I'm working in a, in a vast time distance, um, I've got no problems with H being differentiable, so I can pull this out as a, I can bound this by the second derivative of, of F and the expectation of, of the difference between W and WZ. Uh, and I can just use a, the same bounds that we had on the second derivative to give me a bound almost immediately. Uh, this, this essentially, the proof is that and the, the proof is almost vacuous. It, it's almost it's, it's, all we're doing is using the definition. The definition is is designed exactly to give us such a nice simple proof. So what's the price that you pay? So the price that you pay now is that um, we have to say something about how to construct this zero biased version here. Um, we have to say something about how to construct that in a way that makes it close to the W that I started with. So we, we, we need to couple we need to couple these two random variables, W and the zero biased version, and somehow show that the expected value that of the difference is small. And so we've it's like so, margin distribution for WZ is given. Yes. yes. And we need yeah. to have a joint distribution W and WZ. Yes, yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. so we 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 know the we, we, we know the marginal, at least in terms of the, the distribution of W, but, but we need to do more than that. We need to actually construct the, the, the joint distribution. We need to construct them on the same probability space to be able to say something about how small this difference is. So yes, yeah, so, so this, this, this inequality will hold for, for any, any coupling. There's no, there's no restrictions on the joint distribution so far. And this, this proof, we're just using the marginal distributions. So we, we do really want to, to find some, at least some, so yeah, so, so, so what we want to do is preferably find the, the coupling, which gives us the smallest such upper, upper bound for the, taking the infimum over, over the um, bivariate distributions. In practice, we don't, of course, need to achieve the infimum as long as we can get something that we think is about right. And so we, we need, we, we're not going to necessarily prove that we've achieved the infimum. We, we just want to establish something which gives us a rate of convergence, which we sort of either know is correct or suspect is correct, at least. Um, when is the infimum achievable? That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure. Off the top of my head, it's a good question. And it's a very general question, yeah. It's yes, yeah, yeah. Where, yeah. where it depends on distribution and so on. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, and I can't think of anyone who's answered this question. <laughs> Under what conditions on the W that you start with is the infimum achievable in that coupling? Okay, I think it's a good question. Yes, sorry. Um, Sorry, now I'm thinking about that question. It, it, it's a very nice question. I should I should park that for a, for a little while. I'll, I'll give it some thought in a few minutes, but not yet. <laughs> um, so you could you could very well argue at this point that I've um, that I've gone completely against the spirit of Stein's method, in that one of the things that I said was that sort of made made Stein's method more practical than just thinking about bounding this vast time distance directly, is that is that okay? So if I want to work with the Wasserstein distance, I need to I need to think about couplings of W and Z. Right? I need to think about a coupling W with a normal random variable. And one thing I said was that well, it was nice writing down this sort of expression on the on the right hand side of my Stein equation, got rid of my random variable Z and left me only with a single random variable W. So I didn't need to think about any couplings anymore. So I, I argued that as a as a as an advantage of what we've done. Okay, and you can tell me that I'm obviously a, a liar in some way because now I've gone straight back to, to coupling random variables and I've, I've told you now that if we're going to bound this thing on the right, we need to 
we, we need to think about a bivariate distribution again and, and uh, the sort of nice thing is that coupling w and its size bias version at least in sorry zero biased version at least in lots of, of lots of lots of very reasonable examples is an, is a not too hard thing to do in that i can explicitly construct a size bias uh, sorry zero biased version of w in terms of the, the essentially in terms of the w that i started with and so these objects are, are relatively natural to 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 couple to construct together on a probability space so one, one setting in which that's a very natural thing to do is not surprisingly the case where I have a sum of independent random variables. And so we have, there are results which, which give us an explicit construction of this zero biased random variable in, in that setting. So if I've got a, these X's again are, are independent random variables, each with mean zero, They've each got a variance sigma i squared, um, and we'll make the, the variance of the sum just we'll let that be sigma squared. So all I'm going to do, in a not dissimilar way to the sort of some of the examples we were thinking about earlier earlier today, to construct the zero biased version of my sum um, w, all I'm going to do is choose one of these x's and replace it with a zero biased version. Okay, so I'm going to pick one of these X's and I'm going to replace it by a zero biased version of, 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 that, of that X and leave everything else alone. The difference to other examples we've seen is that I'm not going to choose this, this X uniformly, but I'm going to choose proportional to the variance. So, so if, we make, if we make that choice, so I'm choosing I'm choosing xi with probability essentially sigma i squared, but just but normalized to make that a, a probability, so it's divided into by, by the sum of the variances. But if I choose one of these x's with probability proportional to the variance, replace the x that I've chosen by a zero biased version, then what I get is a zero biased version of the sum. And that's okay, so at least it makes the problem a little bit simpler in that if I can construct zero biased versions of the individual terms in the sum, I can then construct the zero biased version of the sum. It gives us a natural way of doing that. There are results which, which generalize this kind of lemma to the case of um, dependent random variables and multivariate random variables. Um, for the sake of simplicity, I've, I've stuck with independent um, just because that's, that's, that's what, what I thought we had time for, and I can, I can show you a, a proof without getting too bogged down in notation, and the proof is not too is not too bad in, in this case. But, but you can generalize this result to sums of um, dependent things to multivariate things. Um, at least once you've generalized to a suitable multivariate definition of zero bias thing as well, which I'm not going to talk about. But we'll see a similar sort of result when we talk about size biasing later on in the Poisson case as well, and, and that, that I'll do for dependent things. Um, so I'll, I'll show you how that works later on in, for a slightly different kind of coupling, but with, with some dependence as well. But this result is not too hard to see. Um, so the proof is, well, one line, if you don't mind your line, your, your line containing lots of equations. <laughs> um, so, so, so what I want to show is that if I've got a suitable function g, the expectation of wg of w is expectation of g primed of wz so this this was that this was my this is the thing i'm claiming is my side is my zero biased version so i just need to show that this thing here is, is what i get once i start manipulating expectation of wg of w so let's replace w by it by the sum of the x's we can bring that sum out for each of these each of these i's, I can just write w, I can write w as xi plus the rest of them. So in a dissimilar sort of way as we did earlier on, there's no, no tricks here. Then we use my definition of zero biasing, but not for the random variable w, but for the random variable xi. So this was, this is essentially the reason why we had to define that, that zero biasing for 
random variables with any finite variance um, because 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 my um, x i has variance sigma i squared, so I'm, I'm not, I can't just define it for random variables with variance one. So I so I apply my definition. What does that do? It takes expectation of x i times a function of x i into sig into the variance of x i times expectation of that same function. Sorry, that, the, the derivative of that same function of, of my zero biased version. So I'm, I'm essentially getting rid of that and replacing it by a variance. I'm replacing g by its derivative and xi by a zero biased version, but everything else is left alone. Then we'll multiply and divide by sigma squared, because that turns that thing in this sigma i squared into, into the probability that I choose at this particular random variable i, this particular random variable like xi. This thing inside my sum is essentially exactly what I want to end up with more or less, except instead of having this random index that we had before, I've, I've, not, I've got the, some fixed index i with a sum over here, but then all I'm, all I'm doing is essentially then unconditioning on, on this on the, on the index that I chose, this um, this i is, is just a mixture over my my numbers one up to n with with mixing probabilities given by exactly this exactly this variance ratio of variances. So yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think so. All I'm doing so replace w by the sum, just expand things out a little bit just to to make my index i explicit, apply zero biasing to xi, multiply and divide by sigma squared, then write, write this as, write this as a, um, write this in terms of random index i, just, just use the definition as random index i to rewrite these things, and that gives me exactly what I want. It's, it's, it's not terrible. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop very soon. Let me just, what's the right place to stop? Okay, yeah. So let me just say a, one thing, one more thing. So with that, um, so if, if I want to, let me just go back, if I want to apply this general result on, um, this general result on normal approximation in terms of zero, in terms of zero biasing, if I've got a sum of independent things, what's the difference between the, the W I started with and the zero biased version? It's just exactly the difference between the X that I chose and the zero biased version of that X. So I can apply that result um, it gone? Im immediately here. I can rewrite that in terms of the individual X's rather than this random, random index I if I've chosen that I want to. And I, I can work with that if I if I know what my zero biased version of my x's looks like, then I can I can write this I can write this sort of thing down. Um, if I even if I don't, I can do what's sort of obviously suboptimal and just apply the triangle inequality here um, and get some bound get some upper bound um, on on each of these um, on each of these terms individually. This the the um, my the sigma i times the expectation of my um, of my um, zero biased version and sigma i times the expectation of things I started with and get some bound which is it's so almost clearly the, the wrong thing to do I mean get applying the triangle inequality to turn this turn this difference into a sum is, is obviously going to be suboptimal but but it gives me something which is actually not too terrible I mean it's not it's not completely awful um, if, we, if we needed to work with that Let's have a, a stop for a break there, I think. Okay. If, if that sounds reasonable. Yes, um, yes. Uh, well, we ten, eight ten, minutes. Yeah, eight to ten minutes, something like that. Is that, that sounds, okay. Is that okay? You can. Yeah, yeah sure. I think okay. Start at 12. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll start yes. at 12 minutes faster and give us a 10 minute eight, break. Seven minutes, eight, eight, seven, eight, ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> All of them. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If you.
And if you wanted to talk about, if anyone had any particular questions, I can, we can talk about those now, otherwise I'll let me take a break for a minute, but I'm happy to talk a little in a minute too. I think it's a good time to start. I think it's... Anyone have another questions to ask Fraser before he started? Yeah, but it's, I should wait like two minutes until someone will write a question. So you can ask a question during the lecture. Yes. <laughs> and we can start. Please, Fraser. Okay, I'll, I'll make a start. But questions are, are very welcome. Um, if you have any questions now or, or as we go along, then please, please do ask. So this, this gave us a way of, of what we just did gave us a way of thinking about Wasserstein bounds using this zero biasing idea. Um, getting bounds in Kolmogorov distance is a little bit harder. Somehow we're, we're implicitly using some differentiability somewhere. Somehow this definition is set up most naturally um, for, for Lipschitz functions H. If we want to get a bound in Kolmogorov distance instead, at least the, the only way that I know how to do this, the only way I've seen this done, at least that I'm aware of, um, is by imposing some extra restrictions on this zero biasing, this zero bias coupling. For example, that, um, that this coupling is bounded in the sense that there's some number delta, which perhaps depends on some underlying parameter n or whatever, um, such that the difference between w and zero bias version is, is at most is almost surely at most delta. So this really relies on on, a, on a, having a coupling. Right? This is not a this assumption is not an assumption about the distribution of W or the distribution of its of its zero biasing. It's really it's a zero biased version. It's really about the coupling that we've got. So this requires some some very explicit coupling to, to be able to be applied. But then if I can if I have such a bounded zero bias coupling, then I can bound the Kolmogorov distance in terms of essentially a small multiple of delta. Very interesting constant. <laughs> yes, yeah. so the, the constant comes from, uh, where, where does it come from? It's actually a 1 plus square root of 2 pi over 4. No, it's not even that, it's, it's this, there's an extra, it's what I just said, plus an extra 1 over square root of 2 pi. Okay. So, um, all, all these nothing, nothing magical yet. <laughs> yes, no, no, no. There's, there's nothing magical about 2.03. It's just a <laughs> the, no. the square root two pi's just come from the sort of the proof that we use, which bounds differences between um, difference between the the, the um, distribution function of a, of a standard normal at some point little z and some point z minus delta. So two, two points which are, which are delta distance apart and just use a bound on the normal distribution function for those two points which gives us a one or two square root of two pi's that end up kicking around this proof. So there's, um, nothing, there's nothing magical. The, so the, the bound in this assumption we sort of get, let me, let me sort of let me not say very much about the first parts of this proof. There's nothing too exciting or different. Um, but where, where we sort of end up using this boundedness is in, is in looking at um, differences like this. So a little bit differently to, to other ways that we've used zero biasing. We've often used zero biasing to transform our WF of W into an f primed of something, um, but sort of for whatever reason, it's in, in proving this kind of result, it works relatively nicely to, to, to do the opposite thing and to transform my derivative into my into a into something else. So I, I end up with two differences of terms, which which so w f of w minus w size uh, zero bias times f of w zero zero biased. I guess at this point, when we're wanting to 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 um, control the behaviour of f, we're going to make fewer assumptions on differentiability and things. At this point, that we we can get it. If I want to bound a term like this rather than a, rather than a term involving derivatives, I can get away with with assuming less about the function 
f and therefore less about the function h, which is perhaps why this works. Um, the boundedness then sort of lets me, so if this delta is the, is the difference between my, my zero biased version and, and the w I started with, um, so this is the this random variable delta is the thing that I'm going to assume is bounded almost surely. So this this is this is the only point where I use the the other bound that we had controlling the behavior of f. We mostly used a second derivative of f bound, but if we use the, the the other bound that we had back in lemma. I think it was two point three. Um, then I can control the behavior of this in terms of this random variable delta, which I can almost surely bound. So. Somehow, the a slightly different philosophy in the proof to be able to take advantage to be able to take advantage of the fact that we um, that we have this bound that we have this bounded coupling and without requiring any um, or too much to, should we say differentiability or anything like this about the function f. So anyway, there's, apart from that, I think I'm going to skip the the rest of that proof. I don't think that has any ideas in that that we haven't really or, already met. What one example where this applies um, is a sort of combinatorial central limit theorem. If I think about a, a square array of numbers, um, and for, so for each, so this is an n by n array, for each i, excuse me, I'm going to, um, I'm going to have some well, I'm going to have some random permutation pi, so it's in this, it's in this random permutation that, that all the randomness comes in in this problem. So I'm going to essentially, for each for each i, choose a choose a random element, but in such a way that I'm choosing every every number between one and n once, and add up each of these each of these random things, each of these ra randomly chosen numbers a. Then, okay, so the so, and the rest of the notation is more or less just handling the normalization because I'm going to normalize this, this, this sum to have mean zero and variance one, but that's not doing anything very exciting. And then I just need lots of notation for averages to be able to do that, but this is not very exciting. These are just row averages and column averages and overall averages of these A's. There's really nothing very interesting going on, going on there. We can work out what the variance is. I can show that the... So... Once I've normalized, so um, just normalized, <coughs> normalized to get mean zero, well, that should be a y, of course. Um, <laughs> that equation is slightly odd, but okay, so the, the, this, is, this should be a y. Um, that's, the, that's the statistic that I'm interested in, in approximating. We normalize it to have mean zero variance one. Then, what, then when I do that, I can show that we have some bounded coupling. There's a, an awful lot of work there. Right? There's definitely a lot of work there that I'm skipping over. I just want to show you an example of where we have bounded couplings just to convince you that, at least try, try and partly convince you that there are some interesting examples where this property holds. And we can show some bound on this coupling in terms of, of, in terms of these elements these constants a, these numbers a that I started with, this variance that I can work out, things like this, which gives me an explicit bound in Kolmogorov distance. So, anyway, it's the, the, there's lots of calculations there which I'm, which I'm not going to go into. With, but. So there is a uh, random variable wz and counting uh, such z? Yes. Yeah. Just a quick one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, we, so, so we, we normalize this this random variable y, and then I can take the I can I can construct. I'd say that this is the bit that takes a lot of a lot of work. I can construct a zero biased version of, of that random variable to um, and show that the, that, that coupling is bounded. The thing I've said nothing about. You're absolutely right. Is constructing this zero biased thing. That's, Okay. Okay. So, in some sense, this zero biasing is one of the most sort of natural couplings to use with um, with Gaussian approximation because because we are sort of very very clearly motivated by the by the Stein equation and the two parts of that that we're trying to work with. But there are other kind of other coupling techniques that we can think of. Um, and which can be applied with in, in a sort of setting as well. So just 
very briefly, I'm, I'm going to say very little about this. Um, I can define something called size biasing. Um, so if I take a random variable with, with positive mean, um, so a, a, I'm going to take a, a, sorry, a non-negative random variable with positive mean. So everything, everything here is geared towards, is geared towards um, non-negative random variables. I can define a, a size biased version of Y, let's call it Y star, like this. Um, I'll, I'll say more about this definition later on, um, but essentially what we're doing is we're, we're transforming the Y in such a way that, that we're giving more weight to larger numbers. Okay, so this, this, this is actually much more natural to talk about in the setting of Poisson approximation. Um, so we'll say a lot more about this later on. But, but given that it's been used so much in, in Poisson approximation, it's, it's, it was sort of natural, I guess, at some point for somebody to think about whether we could use it for Gaussian approximation too. And it turns out that you can. Um, again, if we can, um, if, we, if I want to prove that, say, Kolmogorov distance bounds in, in Gaussian approximation using size biasing, I can prove these kind of results. Again, assumptions of boundedness of this size bias coupling are, are very useful. Um, and I can, I can prove results which I'm not really going to say very much about, I don't think. Okay. This, we're going to talk about size biasing a lot later on. Essentially, this is just, this is here just to sort of show, that, show you that you can use it in, in a Gaussian setting as well, um, in, case you, in case you ever want to. These zero biasing and size bias couplings are just two of a, a whole family of these kind of coupling constructions um, that, that, you, that you can use. I mean, it, the sort of general philosophy is, okay, we're going to, we'll have some sort of polynomial function here. We'll have some function or some derivative of that function here. I mean, in, Zero, in zero biasing, what did I have? I had just a constant there and a, and a first derivative. derivative. In um, size biasing, I've got some, um, I've got a, essentially a linear thing and, a, and no derivatives, just a function I started with. So that they're, they're in the same sort of family if you look at them like that and look at the, the other constants that we had floating around, just normalizations to make this, make this transformation well defined. And you can define whole families of these things um, and show that they exist and that, that, that these things are well defined. Uh, it's not, although there are one or two papers that deal with these, with these kind of much more general family of transformations, um, I've, I've yet to see anyone make very, very good use of them um, in applications of Stein's method. Essentially, it seems that so far at least zero biasing and size biasing are sort of are the two which are most, most naturally applied and which, which somehow cover the, cover the most interesting situations, but there are a whole family of these things um, and they are they're well defined for a whole, for, for many, many choices of polynomial to put here and derivative, order of derivative to put here. Okay, one final comment on, on techniques that you can use in normal approximation. There are, there's a lot of very recent work, which I am certainly not an expert in, that combines um, techniques of Malleivian calculus with with um, Stein's Stein's method to give you interesting Gaussian approximation results for sort of random variables living in in Wiener chaoses and things like this, um, sort of chaos expansions of, of things. Essentially, you're combining the ideas of Stein's method with a with a sort of integration by parts formula that comes from Malleivian calculus. Um, this. Is. I, I haven't worked on this, I don't know very much about it, but it's, it's, this paragraph is here just to give you a reference in case this sounds like something that you're interested in. Okay. The, okay. Any other sort of questions on what, or, or any questions on what we've done so far? If you have any questions, you can ask them in chat. Of course. Please write them. I don't have anything, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, everything. As I understand, this like size biased. It's only for Poisson. 
distribution for Poisson approximation? Um, it's mainly for Poisson approximation, yes. Okay. So okay. It, it, it seems to be much more useful and much more versatile in a Poisson setting than in a Gaussian setting. The, the proofs are more natural in a, in a Poisson setting using size biasing. In the, in the same way that the, the, there were some very natural general bands that, that you could write down using zero biasing in, in a Gaussian setting. Um, but you, you can use zero, you can use size biasing in some, for some Gaussian results as well. But, um, yes, Sergei asked yeah. another question, quite interesting. Size bias, size bias distribution, it is the same distribution as integrated tail distribution? So the answer is no, but they're very, they are related. Um, they're not the same, but in fact, I'll, I'll show you the, I'll say more about that in, a, in, in the next half hour. Um, but they are, they're not the same, but they are, they are related. Uh, I think Sergei asked this question because on our last school, there was a size bias distribution and it was exactly just integrated tail distribution, but in very another theory, yeah, it was a branching random okay. box. But it doesn't matter. Just they call size bias distribution, just integrated tail distribution. Okay, so the the way that I'm defining things, I think they're not the same, um, but but they are they are related. So so they're related in in that. Let me get this the right way around. If I if I construct a size bias version of a random variable. And then I take something, so, so, so let's assume, so let's assume I've got a discrete random variable, I'm right? taking values 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever. Okay. If I construct the size bias version of that random variable, and then take something which is uniformly distributed on the number 0 up to that size bias thing, I think that gets me the integrated tail. Uh, I don't know, but... Uh, so I, 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 I think that's I think that's true. But no. if if we will look on just on the definition of size biased coupling key distribution, yeah. and put the function j equals to this indicator for the right, mm -hmm. then it looks like really that is just integrated tail distribution. If um, we choose the function j as a step function zero before some point and then one after uh, some point. Yeah, maybe. Um, but maybe I'm wrong, yeah? On the left we will have mu multiply on probability y is greater than x, y star is greater than x. Yes, y times the... Yeah. On the right we will have expectation of y. Okay, there is another question. What do you think, Sergey? So if we take the... We will think about this later. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, looks yeah. like Sergei is um, right. This might be true, yes. Um, okay, let, yeah, yeah, let me think about that and I need to think for a second. But, um, yeah, let's keep it for a while. And, and in the answer to the other question, then, then no, we won't. I, I'm not planning to talk about Marley von Stein um, in, in these lectures. Oh, okay, of course we cannot talk about everything. Yeah, yeah in sorry. Course. That, was, <laughs> that was not my plan. <laughs> so, right, let me. Okay, let's. So, um, the one last thing on the topic of sort of Gaussian approximation that I want to talk about is just to say that there's a definite relationship here between. Um, say as zero biasing that we've just talked about and the uh, um, variance bounding inequalities which have been looked at by or isoparametric inequalities which have been looked at by a number of authors including Chernoff, um, Hakulis, Chen, Klassen, Borovkov, Utev, many many people in various parts of the world um, have thought about the fact that if I have a um, Gaussian random variable z and the variance of some function g of z, let's not worry too much about what functions g we can write this down for, but is upper bounded by 
variance of z times the expected value of g prime of z squared. So that's, um, there have been many, many authors thought about that inequality and various generalizations of it to, to multivariate settings and, and various other and various other settings. And this is sort of very much related to zero biasing in that, um, so that's just the definition of zero biasing again, in that a, a very simple argument just bounding the variance by, by um, using Cauchy-Schwarz, then lets me apply the definition of zero biasing to get an upper bound which looks an awful lot like the thing we started with, only, only instead of a W here, I've got a zero biased version of W. So essentially the same as this upper bound of Chernoff, Barov, Kovruta, many, many, many people. Um, but, but for any random variable W, and with a, with a size bias version of W here. And we can, we can do the same thing and get some corresponding lower bounds as well. Um, that should be a Z. That X should be a Z. And um, we can get corresponding lower bounds that sort of form essentially of Cray-Morau in inequalities. Um, and again, we can get lower bounds in terms of in terms of zero, zero bias random variables which look essentially the same and aren't doing anything more complicated than kosher schwartz so we can so very it's much, a creation is it, say again sorry it is a creation i mean we have lower and upper bound is the same uh, so they're, they're not the same. The square, the square is on the inside and the upper bound on the outside. And the okay. so they're, 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 very, they're very different. I mean, but um, but but some, somehow the same flavour, but but not very much not the same. Yeah. Um, so somehow these these variance bounding inequalities are very much related to, to zero biasing, in that it's sort of one natural direction in which you, you can. Generalizing these inequalities is in writing down things in terms of transformed, so zero bias transforms rather than the original random variables. I guess it's sort of most most natural to think about wanting to bound the variance of W in terms of W rather than in terms of the size bias thing. And one way you can do that, so just taking the um, you can essentially re replace the, the zero bias by a, by a W and then bound the remainder term just using a sort of the Taylor expansion. And what you get is a remainder and depends on this the absolute value of this difference between the zero bias thing and, and the W we started with. Again, some, if, if we have situations like the combinatorial central limit theorem example where this, where this, um, where this zero bias coupling is bounded, then I can, what I can get out of that is essentially the, the, the Chernoff type upper bound um, plus a remainder term, which at least in, very, in some very reasonable settings goes, goes to zero, so somehow lets me have not exactly the upper bound of the, um, not exactly the same upper bound for a Gaussian, but an upper bound with a remainder term. I may, just in the interest of time, because there's one or two other things I do want to do today, um, I may leave the the example, but we can apply this in a setting where, sort of, just to make everything explicit, let's have a sum of, of independent indicator random variables, um, just to make everything completely explicit. So, um, in in that case, my zero biasing is is uniform. My zero biased version of the of an indicator random variable is just a uniform random variable, and so. Um, with, with all the right normalizations. So I can bound that remainder term explicitly and we get something that, that goes to zero, sort of one over square root of n type term. So we can get these sort of upper bounds, uh, the Gaussian style upper bound plus a remainder term. I guess, so that's sort of one, that's one way to go if I, if I want to turn the general upper bound involving zero biasing into a, into something which 
doesn't explicitly depend on zero biasing is sort of what we what, where I can sort of calculate everything is to have a um, have a remainder term which I can then bound. What, one other alternative is to find conditions under which this upper bound in terms of the zero bias random variable is less than or equal to the same upper bound if I replaced the same expressions if I replaced that, double, that zero bias by the W that I started with. So I guess asking under what conditions can I get back to the, the upper bound that I want, the sort of the thing that holds in the Gaussian case where this isn't a zero bias thing, this is, a, this is just a W. One way that I can do that is just to say, well, as long as I don't mind um, restricting my, fun my class of functions G that I'm thinking about a bit, then I can, I can um, if I assume, if I find examples where this W and this WZ are, are, are ordered in a, in a sensible way, so you can say order, like convex ordering or something, um, then I can replace that W by WZ, sorry, replace that WZ by W. So I can think about situations where, um, so, so, if I, if, so this convex ordering just means that, um, say this kind of inequality holds for, con for, for all convex functions beta, then I'll say that this zero bias version of some random variable x1 is, is smaller than the original random variable x1 that I started with in a, in a convex sense. So I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this right now. I'm going relatively quickly, but if, if that's true, and if I don't mind restricting myself to functions where functions g such that g prime of x squared is a convex function of x, then I can replace the zero bias thing by a, um, just by the w I started with. So I'm aware that was relatively quick. It's kind of away from the main point of it. It's, a, a, it's not really a, that, that wasn't really about probability approximation using Stein's method. That was just about r relating zero bias couplings to, to other other uh, areas, which are very much adjacent to what we're talking about, but, but a, a little bit away, I guess. Because um, I've gone quickly. Because what I want to do today as well is just is spend a little bit of time seeing how the ideas we developed in the Gaussian case carry across to to another set to, to a different setting to the, this time the setting of, of approximation by an exponential random variable. Um, I think it's useful to do that now and then. Um, yes, yes, of course. I think, I think it's, if I went relatively quickly through the last bit, we have some time to actually say something, say something sensible here. So, I say we, we've, we've spent a lot of time developing some techniques and in particular some coupling techniques work for Gaussian approximation. The main point of what I want to do today and for the start of, of next week's lecture as well is see how some of these carry over to, um, to other, other situations. I'll start, I want to start with, it, with the setting again where, we're, where our random variables are continuous because that will sort of make the analogy clearer but then we'll talk about Poisson approximation later on as well. Um, I, what was I going to say? So we'll think about approximation by a, an exponential random variable. This will let us do one or two examples in a little bit more detail as well. Um, and there are, this sort of leads quite nicely onto some discussion of um, queuing related applications that we can talk about next week as well. So that's good. So usual definition of an exponential random variable density function that looks like looks like that. Um, yep. So the, the the steps of the sort of go along with setting up Stein's method for this kind of this kind of setting are essentially the same steps as we went through in the in the Gaussian setting. So so we, we need to start with a with a characterization. So we need to start with some some characterization with a similar flavor as we had in the Gaussian case that will then let us write down the Stein equation that we can solve, we can say something like the solution of that Stein equation, and then maybe we can, we can write down some coupling construction that will let us use that Stein equation. Okay, so that's what I want to spend actually 15 minutes doing.
Yeah. So the, char the characterization that, that we're going to use in the, in the exponential case says that my random variable x is exponential with mean one. Okay, we'll, we'll normalize everything. So we'll think about things which have, have uh, mean one. We're exponential if and only if the expectation of f prime of x is equal to the expectation of f of x minus f of zero for all reasonable functions f. So, in, okay, we have a question from Sergey. So in that equation, we assume the left-hand side is finite, but not the right-hand side. Um, so if we're exponential, so the assumption is about what happens when we're when we're exponential. If we're exponential, the, those two things are the same. So, so if one's finite, the other one is as well. I think is that true? Yes. I, I don't know. I mean, not so. But it's again you need to use this Fubini theorem to prove this that if one of them is finite, then another one is finite as well. Yeah. Yeah. So if my x was exponential, then, then yes, yeah. yeah. So that we can, we can check this characterization and we've got two, we've got two things to prove. We need to prove that if we're exponential, then that holds for all, for all reasonable f. And we need to prove that if that holds for all reasonable f, then we're exponential. Um, so you can, I'll, I'll leave you to do those two things. Some, the one direction is relatively easy. The, the other is again, not too hard. I, there are lots of ways of doing it. You can think about solving the differential equation again. Um, you can check that that if if this is true, then, then the Laplace transform of the random variable X is what you'd get from an from a, um, exponential random variable, things like this. So again, I want to use this characterization to write down a, 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 a Stein equation. Um, somehow, for some reason, writing it down the opposite way around than I was before. But here's the here's the the side that lets me um, analyze the, di the distance between some random variable w that I'm interested in and, and my exponential random variable z. So, so z before was Gaussian. I'm using z here for an exponential random variable. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll keep Z to be whatever we're approximating by. So in a section on Gaussian approximation, it's always Gaussian. In, in an exponential set, setting, it's always exponential. When we talk about Poisson approximation, Z will always be a Poisson. Um, otherwise, I think we have far too many letters. So I'm, I'm using Z to mean whatever, it, whatever my limiting random variable is, whatever my, my target is, whatever I'm approximating by. Uh -huh. But in, in Gaussian approximation, our normal distribution was always standard, zero mean one variance. Yeah, and so here I, will be. So, so yes, I think z z. I'm usually going to take exponential with with, with oh, mean okay. one with grade one. Um, so yes, we're, so we're assuming everything is normalized so that everything has mean one. So one side of my standard equation, I'll I'll see how big that can get as I take the supremum over class over functions h that I'm interested in. Um, the other side is inspired by my by the characterization that we had. This time I am going to assume that f of zero is zero, so I can ignore this term. And I think I really do mean that this time. Um, but yeah. then so in, in general, everything that you wanted to do in the normal case gets a little bit easier in the exponential case because the functions are just a little bit easier to work with. The equate the differential equation is a little bit easier to work with. Um, there's, there's not this sort of extra x floating around in front of my f. So that differential equation is again not too terrible to solve. We can um, we can write down an explicit expression for for that differential equation, and I can find some bounds on the way it behaves. Um, this bound is is extremely similar to what we had in the Gaussian case in that I've got a second derivative of my solution f and a first and a First derivative of my of my function h. This is going to be a sort of Wasserstein type um, upper bound, and I've got the same constant too. I would 
I, I there has been some some attempts to unify the theory of sort of various different families of random variables, but I don't know of something that I don't yet know of something which gives you a good proof of sort of why in both these cases you sort of end up with a with the same constant too. It seems to be I, I, there's the same constant there. It's not clear exactly for what families of random variables you would get this, that same constant. Um, somehow there's a there's something to think of that c could be thought about there anyway. But um, right. anyway, the the proof is not is not terrible. I'm I'm not going to. Um, um, suppose I got a question. Yeah, but it's it's not finished yet. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Okay. I'll I'll carry on talking and and feel free to to carry on typing well, as well. Uh, maybe you Fraser can finish it by yourself. Like, <laughs> please make me clear how exponential approximation <laughs> works. I don't know. Work for something for which it um, works. So. I'm, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. But anyway. oh, uh, <laughs> approximation uh, joined with uh, geometric approximation. I see this uh, subject of your previous works. Uh, so maybe you can tell us uh, something about geometric approximation. I uh, see reference in your le lections. To, to geometric and in the, in the geometric setting. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, yeah, I can say something about that later on. That's fine. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Um, right, so, so we have some bounds. The, the, we're essentially analyzing the function that we've got. It's not terrible, so I'm going to I'm going to gloss over the proof. Right? There's some you can analyze the solution. Let me uh, let me say a little bit about. Okay, so so what we so we've got a, we've got a characterization. We've used that characterization to write down a Stein equation. We've solved that Stein equation. We've got some bounds on the solution. These are more or less the sort of the the steps, the sort of first steps to setting up the problem as a as a in the sort of framework of, of Stein's method. What we might want to do then is think about some um, coupling techniques that sort of work similarly to um, similarly to the zero biasing case that we had before. So now, in so let me go back to the Stein equation in a minute. Okay. So here we are. Excuse me. So back to the characterization. So in the in the Gaussian setting, we defined our, our zero biasing to be such that um, I, I, I could write such that my kind of characterization of my Gaussian was that the zero bias has the same distribution as the thing I started with. This is sort of one way of writing down this characterization of my Gaussian that I, I define zero biasing in, in such a way that I was, I was Gaussian if and only if zero bias, if the zero bias transformation doesn't change the distribution. So maybe we can use that same sort of idea to write down couplings that will work in, or a coupling that will work in the exponential case. So let's do that. Um, let's write down something which is sometimes called, in, in, the, in the Stein's method of literature, it's sometimes called the equilibrium distribution, the equilibrium transformation. I'll write this with, as a W with a superscript E. Um, again, the notation is not particularly good. I, I, I don't think in that E is not the number 2.78, whatever. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's nothing to do with the constant E and it's not, it's not a power. This is definitely not W to the power E. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think the notation is particularly good, um, but. But it's better than zero bias, no? I, okay. I don't know. <laughs> So anyway, but there's this thing that's called the, the 
equilibrium distribution and, and is written with W with a superscript that's a, with a letter E. Um, that's Did defined you see in, that Sergei has the same question as for zero biased, where is like zero biased? Now yeah, he asked, yeah. where is the equilibrium with respect oh. to some process? So we'll, 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 I'll say that and I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to come back to Sergei's other question and that Sorry. question in, in, in just a minute. But we can define this in such a way that we get exactly, exactly the same sort of result, same sort of idea as we had in the in the Gaussian case. In that, um, so I can phrase my characterization of my exponential random variable in that I'm exponential if and only if this equilibrium transformation leaves me alone. Um, so I'm, I've essentially got the. the two sides of my characterization, I'm defining my this equilibrium transformation W in superscript E so that um, if W is a non-negative random variable with mean lambda, so we'll often take lambda to be one, we'll often take these things to have mean one, then the expectation of G prime of my um, equilibrium transformation times that mean lambda is equal to the expected value of G of W minus G of zero for all reasonably well-behaved functions G. So it's essentially going in parallel, doing something analogous to, to what zero biasing was doing, and then I'm sort of taking my, um, I'm taking my characterization of, of the exponential, I'm defining a coupling so that the two parts of my Stein equation sort of look very similar in that I'm, I'm, I can turn my my expected value of f of w into an expected value of f primed of the equilibrium transform of w. So again, let me come back to that in a minute. So again, I get um, some very straightforward um, bounds, let's say, stock again in the Wasserstein distance. Um, so you, my Stein equation gives me a way of writing that in terms of this solution f to my Stein equation. I then just apply the definition of my equilibrium coupling um, so that so that I'm comparing an f prime with an f prime, then bound then bound that in terms of the second derivative and the difference between these two these two things, and bound that that second derivative of f using the, the using what what I know using the solution that we had before. I get a constant two out of that, and so so again I get um, a very simple upper bound. In terms of these random variables, in terms of my my original random variable w and its equilibrium transformed version, but again, the price that I'm going to have to pay is being able to couple these things because now I really do need to know about their joint distribution. That's what I'm not going to get around to do, doing today, um, but we'll see how that how that works on in next week. I'll I'll talk about how this works for. Um, in a setting where we're approximating geometric sums, so sort of version of Renyi's theorem that I'll, I'll talk about next week. Um, so just a couple of other comments and to try and talk about some of Sergei's questions, um, just to finish off in the last couple of minutes. So, okay, so this we said already, so, so the, uh, the other way of defining the an equivalent way of defining this equilibrium distribution is is as the um, is as, is as, an in, is as the integrated tail, which is so that those two things are the same. Um, did I if I, I I don't think I proved that, and I don't think I, I wrote it explicitly as an exercise, but it's quite it's quite fun to check. Which is why I don't think. Which is why I didn't think size biasing is the same as the integrated tail in a, in a discrete setting. But um, now I'm everything that you was everything that the, the good points that you are making has made me confused about this now. And I, <laughs> I perhaps need to go away and write down some formulas. <laughs> but um, we will check this and we will see. Yeah. So Maybe. so 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 so, so will I. <laughs> I need to. I need to understand what's going on. I will want to think about this. Um, and so this this sort of equilibrium 
trying to, I, I think this makes it a little clearer why it's called this sort of equilibrium thing and that we can sort of, we, we understand where the, where integrated tails appear in, in um, renewal theory and, and other areas and sort of, uh, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a sort of more familiar transformation to think about is the integrated tail right, rather than writing it necessarily in terms of um, the, well, in terms of this definition that I've given, I think the definition doesn't, doesn't give you much, doesn't give you as much intuition about the, about this transformation as, as, as the thinking of it as an integrated tail does. Um, so this is, but, but the, the definition makes it somehow clearer that how we can apply it in conjunction with Stein's method. Yeah, it looks similar to size biased coupling distribution here, but a little bit yeah. different. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not the same, I think. So let me... Um, in size biased, instead of G prime, there is like W, G of W. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. And they own different ways, okay. On so, different sides. So. Yeah, yeah, that is definitely, it's not the same as size biasing, but somehow is, and all, all these things have the same sort of flavor in the sense that um, you have some, some derivatives or some differences, you have some, some you know, the, the, all, all, it's, it's easy to see how we can combine these into one bigger definition, um, which, which applies more generally. But somehow these are these are different different settings. I'm just trying to remember where I I've seen um, relationships between size biasing and and integrated tails. And I don't know whether the I'm, I'm I think that the survey paper that you've at least looked a little bit at in some seminars a while ago by, by Nathan Ross has some, has some lemmas to deal with this as well. Um, I'm attempting to open it, but it's, my computer is slow because I'm trying to run two Zoom connections off my internet as well, so. <laughs> uh, but what about the following lecture for today? It's already finished and now we like- um, I, I think that's probably a reasonable place to stop, yes. So if people have okay. questions, then, then we can talk about those, but this, the, the next section is a is a somewhat longer application, and I um, which is I, I don't think we want to start now. <laughs> uh, okay, we have uh, this another question from Nikolai about how exponential approximation relative to geometrical appro approximation is understood correctly. The question. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, so they're, they're very much related in that, um, so the, essentially if you take all of the, all of the definitions that we've, um, that, if, if I take all of the definitions that I've, that I've written down for exponential approximation and I make them suitable for, for, a discrete random variable on the non-negative or positive integers or whatever. So essentially replacing derivatives by differences. Yeah. And essentially that's about the only change you need to make is replacing derivatives by differences. Um, then, I, then I get essentially the construct, constructions that work for geometric approximation. So, so you can define discrete versions of all these things and they give you they give you characterizations and couplings that work for geometric approximation as well. So they, the, it, it's very much the case that these two things are, are analogous to each other. And they, 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 they work very much in parallel. I, I don't know of any papers that deal with them both together in the same way, you know, sort of make definitions which somehow cover both settings simultaneously. But if you hold hold up side by side papers that do geometric approximation and papers that do exponential approximation, then very much they're following the same steps, making very very similar definitions. 
the I guess one other thing to say about um, exponential and geometric is you, you very much have a choice of characterizations to to um, in this case as well. So it's not it, it's not that, that this is the only characterization that works. Um, you can define other ones which give which gives equally good formulations of Stein's method. So it's and, and, and the same is true with, ge with geometric approximation too, in that you can define various different ways of, of setting up the problem, which gives you slightly different different coupling constructions, but work in a slightly different way, but are somehow analogous. So let me see if I can find what I was looking for in this survey paper of Nathan Ross. This might take one second. If you have other questions, then type them or ask them while I, while I scan this paper for what I'm looking for. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So there's a... Make it a little bigger. So there's this result which says that, so I have a size bias distribution, I have an independent uniform, then I can, I can, get, I can get the equilibrium distribution by, by multiplying the size bias by a uniform. And if what I've written is correct in that the equilibrium distribution is the integrated tail, then the, then the size bias isn't, but it's very closely related to it. Um, so I haven't, let me have a look at the, um, yes, that's, so Sergey's point is almost certainly a, almost certainly true in that, in that there'll be similar results in, in um, Herman Torrison's book. Um, because that's a, an excellent book that has many, 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 many results in. Um, I looked here because I knew where to find it here. <laughs> so then maybe Sergey can answer on his own question, equilibrium <laughs> with respect to some process. I, I think, Sergey, you can already join to our conversation. Not, not to write in. This is a question to you, okay, thanks. <laughs> well, do we have... So, Fraser, thank you for the lecture. No, thank you for your comments, questions and participation. Uh, see, we will have two seminars where we will study this lecture and then our next lecture will be in one week. Yeah. At the same time, yeah. everything the same. Same place. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know, I, and we said at some point three or four lectures, um, I'm happy to do, to, to do four if, if that's if people want or if people will prefer, I, I'm equally happy to cut it short to three. It will change slightly what I do next week. Yeah, but, um, at this moment, at least I prefer to have so many lectures as you can okay. give us. But we will discuss. We will discuss. Yeah. Yes. yes, yeah, yeah. Um, it would be helpful to know before next week whether I've got okay. <laughs> just just so that I can. Um, my, my if in case it helps. So my plan would be if I had two lectures, I would go slowly through some. Um, um, exponential approximation and talk about the, some queuing theory and things like that next week and start Poisson approximation and then fin finish Poisson approximation the week after. Um, otherwise, I, I may try and make some comments about what's in the rest of the lecture notes as well, but only very briefly. Um, if I had only one week left, I would probably still do the exponential approximation example relatively slowly, talk a little about some queuing theory, probably less than I would otherwise, and go very, very quickly through um, 
some material on Poisson approximation, just highlighting the just the one or two most important points. Um, I think, okay. and I, I probably wouldn't get time in that case to talk about anything beyond anything beyond that. Yeah, Nikolai, Nikolai excuse that he cannot switch on his camera, turn on his camera because it doesn't work. He said, and. Uh, I need to mention, I don't know if Sergei didn't say it in previous lecture, that Fraser, he's a young father, and mm -hmm. as I understand, he has three chats. Maybe yes. we'll, we'll see this child at some point, because we <laughs> hear them and it, we see them. Yes, well. my, my, my daughter especially, she's only three, but she's the youngest of, of, of three children, and so she knows that if she wants to get attention, she has to be loud. So she will. <laughs> She is loud and she is persistent. So you will hear her in the background many times. I mean, it, it's fine. It's like this. I, I I don't know how atmosphere of quarantine that all of us sit at home and it's like <laughs> yes. real home atmosphere here. Yeah. There is very little I could do to keep her quieter. So. <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> yeah, certainly say that. Like singing birds. Yeah, that's true. So thank you everyone to come into the lecture. Yes, thank see you, you next week. I'll see you see you next week. <laughs>